Okay. Good. Uh, we have done quite a bit on stretch Brownian motion, but this came to a natural end when we had this uh, Dimash 2C decomposition. And I now want to switch to a slightly different topic where we will see some open problems uh, where I'm still far from a solution, but where my feeling is that the notion of stretch brown air motion can help to solve some well-known problems. So as a general theme, I put Keller's theorem here. Okay, can you read it? If you're not, yeah. And thank you for switching on your screens. It's very nice to see you. So this is a theorem from 1972 and it's important and I will tell you the ramifications and in particular the open questions. And what I'm talking about is in a paper which is called from Bachelier to Dupier via optimal transport. So everybody knows Bachelier, our saint. Everybody knows by now uh, what optimal transport means. What Dupier have to, has done here, I will mention in a moment. This was a very influential paper for practitioners. And uh, this paper, it will very soon uh, appear. It is by uh, Goody Bama, who is in the audience. Hi. Uh, Matthias Beigelberg, Bama, and myself. And it will appear in Mathematical Finance very soon. But of course, you can find it on uh, uh, archive or my website. And uh, this is the special volume uh, for 25 years of this journal. I remember very well when there were this, the discussions how to found it and so on. And so this mathematical finance, the journal is now 25 years old and we were invited to contribute a paper. It's a kind of survey paper, uh, but I want to uh, report what we have done in this paper on the theme of Keller's theorem, where we here we prove nothing new, uh, but but it gives a good uh, overview of uh, of the techniques here. Okay, so let me go even back a little bit further in history. So there is Volker Strassen had a very beautiful theorem in 65. And let me say what this is. Okay, let mu pi i equal 0 to n be a peacock. So I think you all by now know this uh, funny games of words. Uh, the French call it processus croissant, croissant pour l'ordre convexe. So it's an increasing process in the order, uh, in the convex order. So mu t be a peacock on Rd. We can make it in the d-dimensional setting. <coughs> and peacock means that the mu ti are increasing in convex order. And for Strassen's theorem, it's important that we have only finitely many steps of time. And then uh, <coughs> there exists a martingale m uh, ti to n, uh, okay with law of m ti equal mu ti. So this is a 
what we call a mimicking martingale, uh, which interpolates here. Okay, so yeah, to come here right away to Dupier, a typical situation is when the mu ti are the uh, <clears throat> the risk neutral uh, measures or called martingale measures in the context of mathematical finance at times ti. It is a little observation if you know all the European options maturing at time ti. This is the same as knowing uh, these measures here by some elementary formul formulas. This is called, I think, Brieden Litzenberger. And the, the, I, the question is, well, do we have a martingale here? And what Strasser showed, and showing the importance of this convex order here, that you really have a mimicking order, <coughs> a mimicking martingale. And let me, let me say, first of all, uh, it's n equal 1 is already the general case, because you simply can uh, paste these things uh, n times, so n equal 1 is already the general case. Okay, and of course we have seen, for example, our beloved stretch Brownian motion yields even a martingale, and we have additional properties. Uh, it is, uh, well, uh, it is a diffusion process. But in particular, it is continuous uh, and uh, strong Markov. So we can have this. Good. So this was Strassen, and this is very much in discrete time. Now, what has Kellerer done in 72? As I mentioned already, so Keller uh, passed to the uh, situation where mt is given in continuous time. So you have a continuous, uh, <coughs> uh, a, a continuous peacock, processus croissant pour l'ordre convex. Uh, but of course, Mark Yor. I mean, Mark Yor with co-authors, they wrote a, big, a, a book on peacocks and they were a lot making fun that the peacocks are so beautiful birds and so on, and very proud, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, so, <clears throat> okay, and we are still on RD. We will soon come to D equal 1, but this can be done <clears throat> on RD for the moment. And the, the question is, is there a mimicking martingale, okay? And uh, the answer is yes. And what I call a cheap theorem, which is, and I could not say who did this really, probably Kellerer, but the cheap theorem is there exists a Cadillac Martingale, which is now mt. Okay, exists a card like Martingale, uh, and which is mimicking the given mu t. So why is this a cheap theorem? Because it's really it's uh, it's very easy, and I just show you uh, the proof. Yeah, I put here Cadillac. So of course, continue à droite, limite à gauche. Everybody knows this. I, every martingale by definition has Cadillac paths because that's a, that's a theorem. You can always find a version with Cadillac paths. Uh, so I, it was not necessarily to put it, but it will be the theme which I will deal with is whether you can have continuous, yes or no. And the cheap theorem is we can always find a, 
uh, a, a martingale possibly with jumps and this is why I put this uh, uh, this word here. Okay, so the cheap theorem, let's recall the proof. Uh, well, you do the obvious thing. Let S equal the collection of all S equal 0 T naught less than T1 less than Tn equal 1 and M S T zero less than T less than or equal to one <coughs> uh, mimicking Martingale. And and what I mean here, this is S mimicking. So at the at the given points T naught until Tn, it should have the correct uh, measures, the given measures at times T0 to Tn. This is the, the MST. In between, we don't know. We don't know, but we can do this for every S. And these mimicking martingales, it could be from Strassen, just where there are no particular properties, but there is no loss of generality to assume that for every S it's continuous, it's strong Markov. In fact, it's a diffusion process, for example, given by these stretch Brownian motions. This is just to filling in the martingales along this partition here. And now this set S, okay, is of course directed. We want to go <coughs> Uh, so the question is, is there a limit where S is increasing of the MS? Yeah, I call the MS, which are martingales indexed by zero one. Okay. <clears throat> so S, the set of all these partitions, is a filter. It is ordered in the obvious way by inclusion. And can we go to a limit? Yeah, you either have this abstract filter or you can uh, here take a refining partition, just the dyadics, and reduce to a, a, a sequence, whatever is more convenient. This is not very important. Now I have to get something to clean here. Oops. Just a moment. My beautiful light board here. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, can we pass to a limit? And the answer is yes, in the Skorohot space, which is D, oh, it's not yet really dry, D01 and with values in Rd, we're still in Rd, okay? Uh, yes, in these, uh, this is the Skorohot space. This is the space of all Cadillac functions on 0, 1 with values in Rd uh, and Skorohot defined a topology on this such that these, by definition, <coughs> we have each of these ms 
เอ่อที่ considered as a probability measure on the space d zero uh, one r d so just a martingale is a collection of trajectories okay these trajectories are Cadillac so this is a probability measure here and you consider these martingales as measures on this space and this space that's a Polish space it is designed exactly in such a way such that you can pass here to a limit by compactness okay easy compactness okay there exists a limit mp okay by compactness which is and this is a martingale you just check that the martingale property is retained in the limit but the question is uh, now the interesting question this was end of the proof of the cheap theorem so this is somehow the uh, topology the Skorohod topology on the Skorohod space is designed exactly in the way that you have this compact compactness result okay so the questions are is this limit is m Markov and is it maybe strong Markov we have seen there is an important difference and Markov is it continuous is it unique okay <clears throat> these are natural questions and the point is d equal one is totally understood one can say totally understood the uh, the theorem of Kellerer what he showed is that the strong Markov property is retained in the one-dimensional case this seems trivial at first sight because of course the these MST the uh, the basic the building blocks here of course they always need only the information in each of these intervals from ti to ti plus one what happened at ti and this shrinks to zero so it seems obvious that in the limit uh, the the evolution should only depend on the present position so it should be markov but this intuition is not correct and it, it needed a very nice proof by uh, Kellerer to prove that you can have the uh, that the uh, limit is in fact a strong Markov process okay then the question of continuity I will exactly focus on this question of continuity in the in the sequel I will not elaborate on this and then there is the question of uniqueness and as we will see there is a remarkable series of papers by Lauther in uh, 2008 is anybody in the audience who knows uh, this George Lauther personally no I don't know him personally either is very interesting because these are wonderful papers but only one has appeared in Annals of Probability the others are simply on archive very rarely cited but really beautiful deep stuff really hard and the Lauther he did yeah he did in, in Cambridge his PhD uh, with Baxter and then he went to Goldman Sachs and apparently in this year uh, eight yeah this was his PhD this series of papers which he only did uh, after entering I think around 2000 in Goldman Sachs 
he took a little time and wrote wonderful papers. And apparently he's a very busy person in Goldman Sachs and extremely clever. Okay, but he completely finished the story in, uh, uh, in for the one-dimensional case. But if we have D, the uh, higher dimensional case, this is completely terra incognita. Virtually nothing is known. And my feeling is, and I've, I've spent quite some thought of it, but not yet arrived at anything very reasonable, is that the notion of stretch Brownian motion, which makes perfect sense uh, in the d-dimensional case, can help to get some insight in the higher dimensional case. So this is a really important research question and I hope uh, to trigger your interest in, uh, in, in, in these kind of questions. So we will focus on the continuity here and now before we, before we even start, let's make a very motivating example. So here is, here is an example. I, I define mu naught okay here I have zero uh, no I have here sorry minus one zero one mu naught put what did I put here uh, yeah say it's here three quarters one eight and 1 8 something like this and mu 1 is it's a little bit arbitrary what I'm doing here 1 over 4 3 over 8 3 over 8 <coughs> so you have these these measures here which at time 0 there is more mass at 0 and uh, uh, at point minus one and one uh, somewhat less and here it decreases and uh, it uh, intuitively we come from here to here by spreading mass from uh, from zero to plus one and minus one and we take the mu t's is which one is it we take one minus t times mu naught plus t times mu one then gradually we give here uh, we spread the mass from the midpoint to the two out points now it is clear so this is this is our peacock the mu t now it is clear what the interpol the mimicking martingale is and that there is only one choice namely a Poisson process which jumps here uh, at zero and at each time it, it, it goes with equal probability and the right intensity here uh, it jumps to the left or to the right. So this is just an example of a peacock where Obviously, there is no continuous martingale uh, which induces this peacock, but there is a very nice Cadillac uh, martingale. So bottom line of this very easy example is, in general, you cannot hope for continuity. You must impose something. So this is the example. Very easy. And now I will show you the wonderful theorem by Lauther. This is one of his theorems in 2008 and it's very important. This only works for d equal 1. Okay <coughs> and uh, <coughs> suppose the peacock mu t is weakly continuous
So weekly continuous means in the weak topologies of measures. This is just to a, a technical assumption, not very important, because if you, if you make this not gradually, but that it jumps from the behavior of mu naught to the m m behavior of mu one, then you have no chance of avoiding the jumps. Okay, so weekly continuous just by this uh, condition, it's not very important, but very important is and support of mu t is convex for each t. Okay, then it follows there exists a continuous <coughs> mimicking martingale. Let me have a look. Uh, there exists a continuous <coughs> and uh, strong Markov martingale. And there exists a unique continuous strong Markov martingale. So we have everything. Look at the example. Here the support is not a convex set we, because we have these holes here. And the idea is, well, it can happen <coughs> that uh, uh, the, when there is holes, that in the limit you, uh, you lose the, the continuity. Yeah, in the limit of what? Think of hmm, how am I doing it? I want to motivate uh, the example here. Okay, why does it have something to do with the convexity of the support? So what we would need is that here there is some mass of each mu t and that this avoids this jumping behavior in the limit. Because when you take, if this is mu, say, mu t naught, <coughs> or this is mu t1 and this is mu t0. So think of a little, in this peacock, a little uh, discrete step. Well, then we have an mst which is continuous. How, how does this work? Okay, it works like this. You can start here some Brownian motion which goes and which is which ends that it's either it goes to one or to zero and is stopped there. This is the idea of such a diffusion which is continuous and mimics the, the distribution at time t naught and t1. But this can be done in the limit. You don't find this, this continuous behavior in the limit when you shrink these two things together then in the limit the, uh, the uh, trajectories will jump. Why? Because you don't have any mass in between. And if you would have some mass in between, then we would have some other uh, uh, points here, which go here and there. And this would avoid this behavior that in the limit you have jumps. Okay, if it did not become clear what I was just, I, I just tried to build up some motivation why the convexity of the support is the crucial ingredient that you can pass to a limit of these MSTs uh, in the uh, strategy of our cheap theorem and maintain the continuity. I don't talk about the strong Markov I don't take, talk about the uniqueness, these are deep uh, theorems, but I want to elaborate on the continuity. And what I will show you is under some stronger conditions than this convexity, uh, and this thing we always need, uh, under, by, by giving a stronger condition, we can, and this is what we did in the paper with uh, Goody and with Matthias, 
we can give a relatively simple argument which shows you what is going on here. Let me, let me still stress how general this convexity condition is. So for example, the mu t, they could all be supported by the rationals. If you, if you support, if you give to all the rationals, uh, uh, give some positive mass, then the support is convex. Yeah, but it's very, very non-intuitive how uh, you can make uh, a martingale which only lives on the rationals, which is continuous, etc., etc. So it is a remarkable theorem by Lauther with a hard proof, which I'm not going to show you, and which I had difficulties to understand myself. Uh, and, and I don't claim yet that I really understood it. And, but we will make a stronger assumption, and uh, then I will give you, show you the proof of the continuity result under the stronger assumption with the idea in, uh, in, in, in the back of my mind, what we can do for the higher dimensional case, if we can do something, because here we would be very happy to impose very, very strong conditions to get some result. Of course, it will not be as beautiful as Lauther's result in the one dimensional case, but Lauther's results are really only bound to the one dimensional case. Okay, so do we still need the, yeah, maybe I keep the example. Oh no, I don't keep it, I make a new drawing. I have to stop today at quarter to one, uh, so there will be a shorter lecture today. So let me make uh, a stronger assumption and now I go to the situation of our paper. This is assumption 6.3 in the paper I have cited before in our paper uh, with Matthias and Goody. Uh, first of all, from now on I speak only for the one-dimensional case. Uh, suppose, in addition to Lauther, so with this weak continuity, oh no, no, I will be more precise. Uh, suppose that uh, mu t is equivalent to Lebesgue measure lambda, okay, for each t. And so in particular, the support is, of course, all of R in this case. And d mu t uh, over d lambda, which I call pt. So it has a density with respect to Lebesgue measure. And this is strictly positive on compact. And something else, I say that variance of mu uh, t plus h minus variance of mu t is equal to h for all t. So I assume that the variance increases linearly. This is not really a strengthening of this weak continuity uh, assumption of, uh, uh, of Lauther, 
because when we assume that the mu1 has first uh, second moments, Lauter gets away with first moments, but this is of little interest. So if at the end the variance is finite, then from the weak continuity you get the variance must increase continuously. That's not difficult. And therefore by a deterministic time change I can always change it that it increases linearly. So this is just technical. Don't pay any attention to this. But this thing here is of course a very strong uh, 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 strengthening of uh, Lauter's uh, uh, conditions. Okay, so this is, uh, and now I, our theorem 6.4 in the paper, which I call a baby Lauter theorem. So the baby Lauter in when we have assumption 6.3 implies <coughs> there exists a continuous martingale, mimeting martingale M. Okay, I will only focus on continuity, not on uniqueness, not on, uh, not on uh, the Markov property. Let me add one thing of what I had uh, what I had erased from Lauther's theorem. Uh, it follows in particular that uh, the question about fake Brownian motion. What is a fake Brownian motion? It is a process which has the marginals of a Brownian motion. So in other words does have uh, Gaussians uh, as, uh, as marginals. So in the one-dimensional case, what Lauter's theorem implies in particular, if you have as peacocks just the, the ones of the Brownian motion, so the Gaussians, then there is a unique martingale which is continuous and strong Markov. Okay, this this is unique, so in other words, there is no fake Brownian motion. There's only one, namely the Brownian motion. Okay, uh, and we have in another paper by the same authors, yeah, and together with Lauther, but we only corresponded with him by email and not personally, uh, that uh, we can, we have constructed a fake Brownian motion which has all the properties except the strong Markov property. If you only impose the Markov property, then uniqueness breaks down. Just a little sidestep uh, on the, the delicacy of these uh, arguments and in particular of Lauser's theorem. Okay, but this is baby Lauther. This is just one aspect, the continuity and the stronger assumptions uh, we uh, uh, can prove it and I can show you now a self-contained proof. So what do we have? What do I want to, yeah. Now an uh, important theorem is the notion of BMO, bounded mean oscillation. Charles Pfefferman got a Fields Medal for his work on BMO in the context of analytic functions and so on. A very, very beautiful uh, 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 notion. Okay, so for those who know it already very well, uh, you can, don't switch off, but you can uh, somehow think about other things. If not for the others, I will recall this, uh, this notion and the theory. So we consider M is MT a continuous martingale. It's important that it's continuous. We also have a notion of BMOs for processes with jumps, but that's not so interesting. It's the, the nice result is about continuous martingales. And now how do I 
define the BMO norm, or to be precise, the BMO1 norm, well, this is the soup over all stopping times tau. And here we put the expectation of m1 minus m tau given f tau. Okay, so this here is a function, an f tau measurable function. And this thing here of this, we take the infinity norm, okay? And the soup over all taus. Okay, very strange thing at first sight, but a very clever idea. So let me, let me go back to our example. Here, I have P1 and 1 minus P1 over 2, uh, 1 minus P1 over 2, and here I have P2, and here I have a 1 minus P2 over 2, and 1 minus P2 over 2. So these are two elements in our peacock from the easy example we were considering before, okay? And the idea is that P2 minus P1, this is the increment H or proportional and it's small. This is what we have in mind. Now, these are two measures. So there is a continuous martingale interpolating between them. So for example, the stretch Brownian motion. So how, how do they look? Okay, they have to start from here. Well, if you're here, you don't move. But these things here, they start and then they go either to here or to here. Okay, now to somehow give a motivation of this notion, let tau, this is the point zero, this is the point one, let the tau be the stopping time when a trajectory hits the point, uh, this is the point one half. So tau is inf over the t's such that m, uh, this is our process mt, uh, is equal to one half, which is in the middle of zero and one here. Okay, so most of the trajectories will not hit this, but with positive probability it is done here. Now, when you are at this point, then conditionally on this point, the m tau minus m1, it has to move by one half. So this thing here, in this example, whatever you do is you get a BMO norm, which is at least one half. So it's bounded from below, no matter how close the P2 and the P1 is, because you have a stopping time. This is you have to condition on uh, f tau. You take the difference how far it travels from tau to the terminal time one. This is not very important. Okay. And condition, and we take the infinity norm, which means we take the worst case. So with positive probability, small but positive, we come here uh, to this point, and then this thing here becomes bounded away from zero. So, bottom line of what I, what I tried to motivate, these martingales, which are, if the two are, are close, they are small in L2 norm or in L1 norm, but they uh, remain away from zero in the Bayer BMO norm. And now this should motivate when we have the BMO Q norm, where the Q is between one and infinity, you could even go on the other side of one, but this is not of interest for us here, is the same thing. But we take here the expectation of, again, m1 minus m tau, but we take it to the power q, okay, given f tau, and the whole thing one over q to make it a norm. Uh, 
Okay, so instead of conditionally on F tau, we take of this movement here, the first moment, we take the qth moment. And again, we take the worst case, we take the L infinity norm of this thing here. And now, there is, yeah, one thing is clear from, what is this? This is Hölle inequality, I believe, that the Q norm is bigger than the one norm, uh, is that they are bigger than the, the so the BMO1 norm is smaller than the BMO Q norm for any Q. But the nice thing is you can estimate it again by the BMO1 norm up to a universal constant which only depends on Q, which can be calculated and everything. So this is a very non-trivial result. So, and this is the theorem of Jon and Nierenberg. Fritz Jon or Fritz John. and Louis Nienberg, who only passed away recently. Well, Fritz Jon, he was born in 1910, I believe, and had to emigrate from the Nazis and uh, was then at Courant Institute. Had some wonderful uh, theorems on, on Radon transform and on convex geometry. <clears throat> so, this is a beautiful result. So, it does not matter, and here it's very important that you have continuous here, otherwise it's completely wrong. Uh, we have here that you can estimate this, and to get some intuition for it, think of this example again. I mean, in this example, the idea how you, how you choose the tau is that you take, when there is a trajectory which goes far, you, can, you go somehow in the middle, and if you know from a Martingale property that it goes here and here, then you have essentially this picture. And if you, of this thing here, if you take the one norm or the Q norm, doesn't make much of a difference. If you, uh, <clears throat> because the point is, when the Q norm is big, uh, <clears throat> then also, oops, do I have it here? Yeah, I have it right here. Uh, uh, when the Q norm is big, then uh, the, uh, the one norm also has to be big. Well, I hope you get some intuition from this picture. I cannot, I cannot explain much better. Otherwise, you simply look up the, the proof. And Goody, we have to look up the proof also, because uh, I'm absolutely sure this, this theorem about BMO also works for d uh, greater, uh, for, for, for the d-dimensional case, uh, has little to do uh, with dimension one. Okay, so the Jon Nierenberg somehow tells you, uh, or at least provides you something that we can play here on this, uh, uh, on this parameter Q. So, this was just uh, recalling the notion of BMO and why this is important. Now I can also take this away. So, sketch of proof. Uh, I will, I still have about 20 minutes, so I will give you the important uh, ingredient of this proof here. 
and this is here, I believe. Yeah. In our paper, you can you can all look up in this uh, in this paper. So this is proposition six point five in this paper. So what is it? We have M I T zero T one is a family of continuous martingales. I in I. I write it abstractly, but it will be indexed by these finite partitions in our, uh, this is what we have in mind. And so each one of the building blocks is continuous and M is equal to the limit along the I in I. Well, we can always find the limit by compactness of the M I. And this is in the Skorohot space of 0, 1 with values in Rd. Yeah, this is important. We, in the paper, we write it up for d equal 1, but I, I have to double check. Uh, but it seems that d can also be bigger than 1. <clears throat> but I, okay, I make a little question mark because I have to double check. Uh, but I think it's, yeah, it is straightforward. Okay, so now uh, we always have a limit in the score out space. So a priori M has jumps, okay? <clears throat> now we want to have that the limit is continuous. And for this is we isolate the condition, suppose that there exists a beta greater zero and a C1 greater than zero, such that Mi, uh, the BMO norm, okay, is less than C1 times H to the beta, where Mi, uh, <clears throat> Mi, uh, I have, uh, da -dum, da -dum, uh, what I mean is Mi is Mi T between T naught and T T naught plus H. So we have a T naught, a T naught plus H. See, these are two consecutive points in our uh, in our partitions, we think of H being small, just as I had it on the picture before. So, and the MI of these building blocks, uh, I, I write it here with the H here to indicate that this is only, the length is only H of this thing here. <coughs> Little matters where it starts. And if I have for each i and for each h, I have a control that it goes down with h where the beta is strictly positive. Okay, but the beta does not have to be one half or one. It can go down very slowly in h. Okay, then it follows the limit m. Now I mean the whole martingale okay, is continuous. So this is what we want. We want that the limit is continuous. And the idea is, okay, if the BMO norm of each of these small ingredients, if it goes down here with some constant, but by some but very modest power of beta, then this is already sufficient for the continuity. And think about what I just erased here, what we had here, of the example with the three points. There we had that the BMO norm of all these MIH, they did not go to zero when H became small. They stayed away from, from zero. But if we have that it goes down with H in a very slow way possibly, the beta, eventually we uh, 
uh, we applied for beta which is slightly less than 1 over 4. Uh, this is what we need in the sequel to apply this proposition. Uh, then this is already enough for the continuity. Okay, so this is the decisive ingredient. And yeah, I still have 15 minutes and this should be okay for the, for the proof. Okay, at least the motivation of the proof. By the way, my lectures here on the live board are recorded. So in case a anybody wants to see it again, if you didn't have enough already at the first time, uh, please ask me and I can provide you with a copy. So, Proof and this proof, once again, I have to double check, but it works in RD uh, rather than in, in R1 only. In the paper, we wrote it up for the one dimensional case. Okay, suppose the limit M is not continuous. Okay, and work to, towards a contradiction. So, what does this mean? There exists an A greater than zero and there exists a kappa greater than zero such that the probability that there exists a T in zero one such that MT minus MT minus uh, is bigger than three A is uh, bigger than kappa. Okay, so we have a card like Martingale, so we can speak about m at time t and the left limits m t minus, and saying it's continuous means exactly that these two things are equal. If they are not equal, then with positive probability there exists some t where it's not zero, so we can find these constants. The, th the three is just for technical reasons. And what we get from this, uh, okay. Uh, okay, for every, this implies, this is now easy. For every h greater than zero, uh, there is t naught and some i in i, such that the probability that the m i t naught plus h minus m i t naught is bigger than a is bigger than h time kappa. Okay, here we have h. Now, why is this so? Well, first of all, we, uh, <coughs> if we split uh, the interval 0, 1 in intervals of length h, and we have that these t's, there must be one of these intervals where with probability h times k, this jump happens within this interval. This is just pigeonhole principle. I mean, completely trivial. Uh, that when you split it into uh, <coughs> 1 over h many intervals of this length, one of them must uh, have this probability. And, well, this is just the t is somewhere in the interval, but now playing around a little bit and making the 3a come down to a, we can have that the difference at the beginning of the interval and at the end of the interval is bounded away from zero by this factor of h. That's important. Okay, so in other words, 
there exists a, a set A in R, I write it only for D equal 1, <coughs> with lambda of A. Uh, what do I have? I have here, uh, uh, no, I don't have here the, the Lebesgue measure with, uh, no, sorry, I have to write about mu t dot of A is bigger than zero, such that the probability that m i t naught plus h minus m i t naught. This thing here is bigger than a under the condition that m i of t naught is equal x. Okay is greater than h times kappa. So what have I done here? I know that uh, the probability that from time t naught to t naught plus 1 it moves at least by a, uh, well the whole thing is a Markov process. If we condition on x there must be a non-negligible non set of x's such that conditioning that we start at this x, it moves by more than, uh, than our a must be bigger than h times k. It's not very important whether we have here strict or non-strict inequalities. Okay, so this is, <coughs> so in other words, the, uh, the first moment of this thing here uh, must be of the transition probability from mu i t naught x to mu i t naught plus h must be uh, <coughs> bigger by than h k. But now we take John and Nirnberg. Okay, and what we do, we calculate the mq of what I call here Px of i and t naught t naught plus h, okay, <coughs> is greater or equal. Okay, before I uh, before I do this, uh, what is pi x? Pi is the transition probability of the martingale indexed with i, which is our nice continuous martingale, from time t naught to t naught plus h if you start it at x. So this is this thing here, okay? So we have here x, we have here t naught, we have t naught plus h, and we have here the trajectories, and this is pi x of i t naught, t naught plus h is the measure uh, when we start from x here where you arrive at time t naught plus h. And if I know that with probability h times k it is bigger than a, okay, so this here is x plus a and here is x minus a, then there is some mass here outside which I can control by this h times kappa. But now I take the qth moment of this, which means that I take this to the power q. Well, the a, you change, don't change very much, you take it to hq. So I say what this is, it, well it's the qth moment and I give you right away the result is h times q times a to the power q and the whole thing 1 over q. Well, if you calculate the qth uh, moment, well, it moves to uh, uh, from x to x plus a, which makes a move of a to the power q in the calculation of the qth moment. This happens with with probability h times k and then 
The important thing is when you take the Q's moment, you get a, uh, a power of 1 over Q. Okay, so this is just calculating the Q's moment. And the important thing is, now this is kappa uh, uh, over 1 over Q times A. And here I have now H times 1 over Q. Okay? <clears throat> so, we get here a 1 over Q when we take the Q's moment. Okay, but what we have, that the Q's, if you do the Q's moments or the first moments, it's the same thing by Jon Lierenberg, up to a constant. So what we get is that the BMO norm, uh, yeah, what do I have? That the BMO norm of the MT, MIT, where we let it run from T0 to T0 plus H, the BMO norm, which is the worst of these things here, is greater or equal <coughs> to that's some constant, okay? This doesn't matter. Once you fix the Q, kappa to the 1 over Q is something. So this is some constant here. And we have here H times 1 over Q. And here I have the BMO norm, where the BMO norm uh, I have erased the thing. It does not matter if I put the BMO1 or the BMOQ norm because up to a constant it's the same thing. Okay? So we have that the BMO norm stays away uh, from zero by h to the power of 1 over q. But the 1 over q I can make as small as, uh, as I want. So I can make it the 1 over q, I can make smaller than the beta which we had given in our assumption and we arrive at the contradiction. This was the decisive ingredient that with the power of the John Nirnberg uh, theorem, we can reduce the, co the question to decide the continuity uh, <coughs> to such a criterion, I have erased it, but uh, that you can control the BMO norm with some power of H here. This reminds about Kolmogorov's conditions on continuity of, uh, uh, of processes, uh, which is of a similar nature. Okay, so we still have, that's the most important step. Now, the next steps to, come to finish the proof, at the next steps we crucially need the assumption d equals to, uh, to 1. And there it's completely open. Uh, whether this, uh, this generalizes to Rd. About this I will tell you next time, and, but you can uh, find everything on, in our paper. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in one week at the slide board. Thank you very much. Yeah, if, are there questions? No. If not, thanks for listening and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Walter.